What's up guys, Doll Matter here, and today we are going to be reacting to another redeemed Zoomer video. So we've reacted to a couple of these guys' videos before, uh, before, uh, before, and this is a new one. He's just released it, I got asked to react to it, and I figured, you know what, strike while the iron's hot, you know, it just came out, people want to see it, so we'll do it. Uh, big theology words explained in 10 minutes, although the video is actually only 8 minutes long, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not a huge theology nerd i guess you could say i'm aware with a fair amount of theological terms um but i'm not like super super you know big on theology so uh i'm sure i'll be familiar with some of these because of how much you know theology has influenced philosophy uh but yeah otherwise a lot of this is just going to be i guess a history lesson for me uh, but anyway, link to the original video down below, and let's jump into it. Ology people like to use big, fancy words for things, but the things these words mean is usually pretty simple. Theology is the study of God, so Christian know. theology is how Christians study God. But what do we mean by God? Christians believe in one God, as opposed to other views of God, and that God is Trinity, meaning the one God exists in three persons. Historically, Christians define God like... T technically, Trinitarianism is not all Christianity, but anyway, I'm sure he'll get into that. Like this. God is not made of stuff, God has always existed, and God is infinitely good, powerful, and knows everything. And the central claim of Christianity is that Jesus is God. Christians agree on most of the big stuff, but theological debates happen where Christians don't agree. Yep. They arise when there's a question that different Christians answer in different ways, which forms distinct theological positions. For example, there's a lot of debates in soteriology, which is about how salvation works. Okay. I've All never Christians that agree that we're saved it. by Christ and the sacrifice he made for us, saving us from sin and giving us eternal life. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, oh, I hit the wrong one. I'm pretty sure this is going to get into like predestination and stuff like that, which is, you know, basically Calvinism. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing a lot of this is just going to be about like different Protestant sects and their like weird views. Because, uh, yeah, Protestantism, you know, has some pretty weird views. But Dep depending on the sect of Protestantism, which I guess, you know, every other sect of Protestantism is like, yeah, those other guys are fucking weird. Who does this apply to? Universalists think it applies to everyone. Annihilationists don't think it applies to everyone, but they don't believe in hell either. The people who are not saved just stop existing. Oh, that's... But the vast majority <laughs> of Christian traditions do believe in hell. That's actually kind of interesting. It's literally like, we're like semi-atheists almost. It's like, yeah, you know, the, like if you're a good person, then there's a heaven. But if you're a bad person, it's just, you know, you just stop existing just like atheists believe. So if that's the case, why are some saved and not others? Calvinists say it's because not God chose Calvinists, to save some yeah. and not to save others. Armenians are people who are from Armenia, but Arminians say that it's because everyone has a free will choice to accept or reject salvation. Okay. Within Calvinism, there's still a debate. What about the people who are not saved? Why are they damned? Infralapsarians think God simply passes over them and they're only damned because of their own sin. Whereas superlapsarians say it's because God actively predestined them for damnation. If that's not simple enough, this that this is like this seems like such a dick move for God to do, right? Like why why would He make you to be damned? Right? I feel like that that, that doesn't that go against the Bible though. Wouldn't superlapsarianism go against the entire like Jesus dying for your sins, but also I'm going to make you not be saved anyway, right? That's, that seems like it, would, it contradicts the Bible. This is nice Calvinism, and this is mean Calvinism. Yeah, There's me also an even softer form of Calvinism, which says Jesus really did die for the sins of everyone. The only reason some aren't saved is because they're not predestined to believe. There's also some middle positions. That that just seems like the uh, superlapsarianism with extra steps. Provisionists believe that everyone has a free will choice to be saved, but once you make that choice, you can't unmake it. Lutherans believe that if you are saved, it's because you're predestined to be saved. But if you're not saved, it's not because you're not predestined to be saved. It's because of your own free will in rejecting it. So they uh, Okay, so provisionism kind of seems like, you know, there is no forgiveness there, uh, which seems to go against the teachings of the church. Um, Lutheranism, how do you, how are you predestined for one but free will for the other? That just seems like a cop-out they only believe in single predestination. How does this work? It's a mystery. <laughs> Hermeneutics is how people understand the story of the whole Bible. You may have a Facebook relative that tries to connect biblical prophecy to current events. Yep. This comes from a hermeneutic called dispensationalism, which takes every prophecy in the Bible very literally. 
They think the promises God made to Israel in the Old Testament apply to the Jewish people today, which is why they focus on current events surrounding Israel. They try to make all the biblical prophecies fit together, and they make a lot of elaborate graphs to do so. They think the story of the Bible can be divided into different dispensations where God makes different rules. So they all right, so we have uh, innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, you're here, kingdom. Okay. They read the Bible more vertically. Covenant theology, on the other hand, reads the Bible more horizontally, seeing the Old and New Testaments as really just parts of the one overarching covenant of grace. They think the promises God made to Israel in the Old Testament really apply to the church because the church is the continuation of Israel. That's pretty So standard. covenant theology sees more continuity and dispensationalism sees more discontinuity. There's a middle position called 1689 federalism, which agrees with covenant theology that the church is the continuation of Israel, but agrees with dispensationalism that the Old and New Testaments are separate covenants. Oh, I didn't realize that was only created in 1689. Uh, that was honestly how, like, the church I grew up in, that was basically how they taught it, right? Um, I thought that was just standard across Christianity. I didn't realize that, one, it didn't exist until 1689, and two, that it was, like, a whole, like, sect of Christians. I just thought that was standard Christian theology. Interesting. There's also a debate within covenant theology. They all agree that the promises, or covenants, God makes with people in the Bible build on each other like Legos, and they're all part of the overarching covenant of grace, which runs parallel to the covenant of works. But some people, who hold to republication, think the covenant God made with Moses was in some way a republication of the covenant of works, where God says we need to do stuff to get stuff. Dispensationalists also sometimes disagree on how to structure all their time periods, but what they all agree on is there's going to be a rapture, in which Christians are all sucked off the earth before Jesus comes back. Speaking of the rapture, let's talk about- Alright, so he's probably gonna get into, like, when and how the rapture is gonna happen. Because there's some people that, like, th th there's some weird thoughts on the rapture, and, like, not even just by, like, random-ass people, because, of course, random-ass people are gonna have weird thoughts, but, like, by, like, official churches, there's some that, like, think, uh, like, there's supposed to be, like, a kingdom that lasts a millennia, right? Some people think Jesus isn't gonna come after, some people think he's gonna come before. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's what he's gonna get into here about eschatology which is about the end of the world really it's just about what's going to happen because the bible talks of two events the second coming of christ and a thousand year reign of christ yeah, yeah okay when did these i didn't realize there was an official term for this but yeah like the the oh man some people some people get like really into the weeds about this stuff two things happen in relation to one another if you think the second coming is before the thousand year reign then you're pre-millennial because you think the second coming is pre-millennium because Jesus is coming back before this millennium, that means the millennium refers to a literal thousand-year reign of Christ on Earth. All people who believe in the rapture are premillennial, which makes sense due to the literal nature of the millennium, but not all premillennials believe in the rapture. Postmillennials think Jesus is coming back after the millennium, or postmillennium, so they think the millennium is a reign of Christianity on Earth. Amillennials think the millennium is in heaven, and it's symbolic for the time between the first and second comings of Jesus, and we're in that time right now. So they Isn't that, like, obviously not true, then? Because, in unless they think of millennium as in, like, a different sense of the word, because it means a thousand years. So, I knew there was people that thought this before, because I, I knew, like, way back in the day there was people that thought that he was going to come around a thousand AD. Um, but, like, how can you believe that now, unless you assume millennium has a different meaning than millennium because millennium means a thousand years and it's been at this point like two thousand years almost because yeah or i guess over two thousand years they think god's kingdom is already here but it's also not here yet since pre-millennials think the reign of christ doesn't begin until he comes back they're generally pessimistic about how the future is going to go since post-millennials think christianity is eventually going to rule the world they're very optimistic about the future, because the world is going to be Christianized. Since amillennials think God's kingdom is already here, but not yet, they're not necessarily optimistic or pessimistic. There's also oh, <laughs> y equals sin If God's kingdom is here now, what kind of impact does that have on the world? Radical Two Kingdoms says that God's kingdom and earthly kingdoms are very separate, so it's not the church's job to impact the culture. Kuyperians, on the other hand, believe that God's kingdom is colonizing this world, so it is the church's job to transform the culture. If okay, so that's, like, very much in line with, like, I guess that's what, like, a lot of, like, the old white man's burden and, like, you know, the British civilizationalists and stuff like that would have believed, you know, that we have to, like, expand and civilize the world and teach them Christianity to save them, and then, then Jesus will come back. You put these beliefs on a scale, Kuyperians are closer to post-millennial, and some post-millennials are Kuyperian because they both believe in Christianizing the world. 
more radical post-millennials believe in theonomy, which says that the government should use the Bible to make laws. Pneumatology is about the Holy Spirit, the person of the Trinity who gets talked about the least. All Christians agree the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts, but some of these gifts, like speaking in tongues, are debated, because cessationists believe these gifts were only for the apostles, whereas continuationists believe these gifts are active and alive today. These are called the charismatic gifts, so people who encourage these gifts to be used more in church today are called charismatics. Another place the Holy Spirit is active is in the Interesting. I always thought they were just called charismatics because the only way you could believe half the shit coming out of those mouths was because they were incredibly charismatic. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm half joking there, but um, yeah, I, I honestly always thought the reason they were called charismatic churches is because, you know, it's a lot of over the top, like very well orated church services with a lot of ridiculous ideas. And I always thought that, that that's why it was called charismatic was because they got, you know, a lot of followers based on their charisma. But I guess not. Sacraments. I'm learning a lot Most here. Most debates are about baptism and communion. For example, should we baptize babies? Paedo-baptists say yes. Credo-baptists say no. Usually they say no because they think baptism is just a symbolic declaration of faith, so it needs to be a personal choice. Most people who say yes think baptism actually does something. If that's the case, what does it do? Baptismal regeneration says that baptism saves. Baptismal efficacy says it only saves if you have faith, so faith makes baptism effective unto salvation. Now let's talk about communion, or whatever but, uh, you want. With baptismal uh, efficacy, wouldn't that only work if they understood what they are doing, right? So then baptizing a baby would be kind of useless? I call it. All churches do communion, using bread and wine as the body and blood of Christ. But are we actually receiving Jesus' body and blood? Memorialists say no, it's just a symbolic remembrance of Christ. But most Christian traditions teach a form of real presence, which is that we actually do receive the body and blood of Christ, even if there's a variety of beliefs as to how we receive it. Physically, So this Christianity stuff is cool, but how do we know that it's true? That's what apologetics is for. Oh, okay. Evidentialists say that we can find evidence for things like the resurrection, and that proves that our faith is true. Classical apologists try to use classical philosophy and logic to prove that God exists in a general sense, Aquinas. and then we can argue for Christianity from there. Presuppositional apologists don't think we should be arguing for Christianity. They think we should presuppose that Christianity is true and then explain why other worldviews are not true. So they admit that they're using circular logic, but their whole point is that everyone uses circular logic. Christianity is the only way to do so consistently because it's the only coherent worldview. I mean, on, on, <laughs> the funny thing is I don't agree with them, but they're not wrong, right? Uh... So many people do use circular logic and justify all of their beliefs with circular logic. Even a lot of, like, you know, hyper-logical atheists constantly use circular logic. Um, I feel like it, that's more of a problem with people that... I, I don't know the best way to say this is... I, I don't want to say lack intelligence because a lot of them are very smart people, but they just lack the desire to actually, you know, go through the thought processes on a lot of this stuff. Um, I, either because it really doesn't affect them, so they don't care, uh, or they only care enough to like kind of sort of get into the weeds about it. But yeah, I mean, mo they, that is true. Most people just do use circular logic, right? They they think what they think because they think it. Uh, and if you ask them why, it's well, because, you know, it's it's basically a bunch of truisms, right? People said it, therefore it's true. But why is it true? Well, because people said it, right? So I mean, they're not. They're not wrong, but they're also not right. I mean, that is how most people think, but that doesn't justify it as good logic. <laughs> In other words, my circular logic is better than yeah, your circular exactly. logic. Yeah, exactly. All right, time for a rapid-fire round. Egalitarians think women and men should have the same roles, whereas complementarians think they should have different roles. Right. Iconodules think that... We I didn't even know that there was a, t a term for... Like, I mean, like... I didn't know there was a term for complementarians, but I always just thought that was, like, the standard belief within the church i mean other than like progressive churches but like are, are progressive churches even really churches we should worship christ through images whereas iconoclasts say we shouldn't have any images of christ old like christians are skeptical of revivals whereas new like christians encourage them biblicists say that anything we believe must be explicitly taught in the bible whereas scholastics think that we can use philosophical ideas as building blocks to help understand the bible okay and that covers most of the theology labels some people don't like that Christians argue about theology so much, but as the Bible says, debating can actually be good if it's done respectfully because people sharpen each other. 
And it shows that they care about it if they're willing to argue about it. True. The more passionate you are about something, the more willing you are to argue about it. If yeah. you don't believe me... Yeah, just look at the biggest Spurgs online arguing about which character would beat up which character in some, you know, fictional universe. Just get any group of Star Wars fans in a room together. <laughs> yeah. You should be willing to yeah. argue about God because there's nothing more important than God. So if you're a Christian, see which of these theological positions you hold to and start building your theology. No, wait, what did he have there for those different ideologies? I think one of them was like Jordan so Petersonism. If you're a Christian, see which of these theological positions you hold to and start... R.C. Sproul's theology, your Jordan Cooper's, uh, Vody Bachman's. Theology. Okay, I thought this was Jordan Peterson. Um, but yeah, that, was, that was an interesting video. Uh, a lot of those terms I was not familiar with. I was I was familiar with a lot of the concepts because, you know, obviously growing up in the church, you hear people talk about these different concepts, but I actually wasn't familiar with, like, the official term, uh, you know, like the, I guess you could call it like, the academic term for the different concepts some of them i didn't even know there there was like another viewpoint i thought so many of those were just like standard christian theology i didn't even realize that there was like another argument for uh certain ones which is really interesting but uh yeah that was an interesting video that might be the video i've learned them out of everything i've reacted to that is not related to some uh, you know, like fictional universe, like S Star Wars or Warhammer or something. That might be the video I've learned the most out of. So that was really well done. So anyway, check them out below. Uh, link will be down below. And yeah, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think. And I'll see you guys in the next one.